Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Seven Wheels of Leadership, brought to you by your Vanderbilt Alumni Association. I am Sarah Whitney Anderson, Assistant Director of Alumni and Student Engagement, and I'm so glad you could join us this afternoon. Today's webinar will last around 45 minutes, with time at the end for questions. Please feel free to type questions as you have them in the questions box on the side panel of your screen throughout the presentation. We will make sure they are addressed in some way before our time is up. We will also be recording today's webinar and post it on Expert Advice webpage and DU Connect. We will share this recording with you via email later this week. I'm excited to introduce you to our speaker as she is one of our amazing partner coaches. So sorry, everyone. Had a little dialogue box come up, making sure we're all good. Um, so our wonderful, she's one of our amazing partner coaches, Casey Carden. Casey Carden, ACCC, PCC, alumna of Vanderbilt, is an internationally recognized business life leadership coach who specializes in working with multipreneurs, mul executives, startups, business-minded creatives, and creative-minded businesses. She works with clients worldwide on communication, authentic leadership, relationships, productivity, and living from passion and purpose. After working as a professional opera singer and actor for over a decade, Casey graduated from Accomplishment Coaching in 2015, where she then served as a mentor coach. In addition to maintaining her private practice, Casey works as a mentor coach and trainer for those coaches and a leadership trainer facilitator for organizations and teams. Casey has presented seminars for nonprofits, schools, le women's leadership summits, and coach training programs. She is available for speaking engagement, group coaching, training, and retreats. Casey's coaching work is soul level coaching for next level results, and she is committed to partnering with Vanderbilt Community to co create the highest possible levels of achievement and fulfillment. We're so excited to have Casey on today, so I'll kick it off to her. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. Come on in, make yourselves at home. Um, as she said, I'm Casey Carden. I am an executive and leadership coach for people who want to bring more authenticity, connection, creativity, and impact to their lives and careers. And as she said, I'm also a Vanderbilt graduate. I hope I'll get to see and meet some of you during the homecoming festivities in a couple of weeks. Um, for those of you who will be out in town, I will actually be the featured speaker for Creative Mornings Nashville that Friday, October 18th at 9 a.m. And I mention this because we'll be exploring and experiencing some of the concepts we're going to talk about here today. So it's a great opportunity to further your learning of the seven wheels if you happen to be in Nashville for homecoming. Um, let's back up a little bit, though. Who am I really? Um, as Sarah Whitney said, prior to becoming a coach, I worked for about a decade as a professional opera singer, which took me all over the world, including a move to New York City 10 years ago just yesterday, celebrated a big milestone anniversary. Um, what I noticed about my career path was that the more successful I got, the lonelier and more disconnected I felt. I noticed that I was also surrounded by other people who seemed successful and miserable, and I didn't want to be one of them. So I hired a coach to support me in exploring what else I might want to do or how I might shift the discontent I was feeling. I unexpectedly discovered that I loved coaching enough to go back to school for it and completely change my professional trajectory. Fast forward several years, I love what I do. I've grown a thriving private practice. I've trained hundreds of other coaches. I've coached clients and companies all over the world, and I still sing and perform regularly. A couple of years ago, however, I noticed that I was feeling some of that old familiar discontent and disconnection with myself and with some of my colleagues. So it wasn't only about the entertainment industry after all. What was having me get caught in that familiar feeling of not enoughness? I always say that my work and I are where the woo-woo meets the to-do. So true to form, I explored the practical items like my work schedule, my income goals, my travel and office logistics, and I tapped into my more spiritual side with yoga and meditation, did some personality diagnostics, who doesn't love a good personality test, um, worked in therapy, and of course worked with my own coach. I'm happy to share that my research and work paid off with a breakthrough in enoughness, that elusive sense of peace and joy that comes from knowing that who you are and what you're doing with your life truly is authentic and aligned. From a foundation of enoughness, one can practice integrated leadership. 
which is living a life that allows you to be fully expressed and authentic everywhere and create space for others to do the same. Very few people wake up and say, I want life to be arduous and meaningless today. Yet they go through the day so focused on checking off the boxes that they end up at the end of the day feeling like they worked really hard, didn't get far enough, and aren't very lit up about themselves or the relationships they have. What I know from my clients and my own life is that all the work and success isn't worth it if that's all there is, and that feeling good doesn't always pay the bills. So how do we practice authenticity and integration in a way that also drives results? The key for me was rooted in chakra theory, which actually stems from sacred Hindu teachings. I knew I wanted to frame the theories in a way that would resonate with any client of mine, regardless of spiritual background or belief system or lack thereof. And I wanted a system that was a perfect mix of the woo-woo and the to-do, the integration of the physical, mental, and energetic bodies that each of us is made up of. So here we are. The Seven Wheels of Leadership contains concepts, tools, and distinctions from ontological and facilitative coaching, mindfulness, neuroscience, emotional intelligence, positive psychology, and some good old-fashioned common sense. Hundreds of people are integrating the Seven Wheels into their lives and businesses each day, and if you commit to consciously utilizing this work, you absolutely will see some amazing results in your life. Not only in your level of fulfillment and your sense of well-being, but also in your relationships, your finances, your overall health, and of course, your impact as a leader. Before we dive into what the seven wheels are, I'd really love to hear from you about what you hope to walk away with from today's webinar. Um, a quick note on that, as a coach, I adhere to strict standards around confidentiality, and I ask that you do the same today. So we'll, we'll mostly be monitoring the input we get, but just in case somebody shares something personal or some sort of personal identifying information comes through, please don't share anybody's identifying stuff out in the world. Um, now I'd love to hear from you. What are some of the challenges you're facing, and what would make this time truly valuable for you today? Throughout the years, I've noticed nearly all of my clients struggling to balance their ambition with their sense of peace, or to find work-life balance, or feeling like they can't have it all, do it all, or be it all. So many ambitious people chase results and achievements when what we most deeply long for is a particular experience of ourselves and our lives. Achievements are a part of that, certainly, but how often have you achieved something great only to feel incomplete? like it's still not enough, or maybe even like an imposter, or that you don't deserve to enjoy what, you're, what you've created. Maybe you're here because you've hit a wall in your career. Maybe your business and finances are booming, but your interpersonal relationships and communications aren't fully connecting. My intention is that you walk away with some high-level reminders and practices, and I say reminders because my job is often not to teach you something new, but to represent you to something that you already know but might not be capitalizing on. My intention is that you walk away with some high-level takeaways that you can apply to your life, career, and relationships for years to come. Um, this work is also cyclical, so you'll find the need to revisit each of the seven wheels to recalibrate and readjust each time you create a new breakthrough, hit a new challenge, or get to your next level. Sarah Whitney, do we have any feedback so far on what people might want to take away? I think we're still being quiet right now, so we'll be in listening yeah. mode for a little warm up time. Okay. We'll give you guys just a second. Um, if any of what I just said resonates, or if you if you're showing up and you're like, I have no idea what I want to take away, but here's what I'm thinking about so far. Feel free to send it. There is no right or wrong answer to this question whatsoever. Um, and the reason I ask, you know, I'm going to go through the seven wheels. Um, but sometimes I find, depending on who's in the in the audience, who shows up, we may already know that there are one or two in particular that might be the places to spend the most attention. Um, so based on whatever feedback we get, it may shift where I take um, the, the presentation or where we spend the most time. Otherwise, I'm just going to do my thing and, and trust that you guys are going to create the value that you came for. And I'm going to drink my iced coffee while I do it. It's so hard to uh, to do this without having any sound from from the people. I like the the feedback and energy performer forever. 
Uh, and just for our audience to know, if you do want to submit, you can do so through the chat box or questions, even though it might not be a question, it could be an answer. So either of those avenues, I'm monitoring for you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and move through what the actual seven wheels are. That may also help you guys get a little more familiar and a little more rooted in what we're doing here. So you can see the layout here. On the left, you have the English translation of the chakra names. And then on the right, you have how they actually correspond to leadership. So as I said, it's rooted in chakra theory, which establishes seven major spinning wheels of energy in your physical body. They follow the curvature of your spine and they correspond to your nervous system. They impact organs, hormones, moods, emotions, actions. Um, there's a lot to dig into around the science and the biology behind all of that. And I actually have a book in process that will address all of that. But for today, the most scientific I'm going to get is to make a quick point about quantum physics. Mostly for those of you who may be skeptical or just need some evidence that this is worth your full attention. Remember, quantum physics has proven that observation affects matter. Therefore, placing your attention and your awareness on the seven wheels is actually scientifically proven to create real change in your body and your reality. This work is about the being and the doing. It's about the energy and the physical manifestation of your thoughts and intentions. So many of us get so focused on the results and the doing that we neglect who and how we're being with people. And often that's actually more important than the tangible results we create or the tangible outcome is the result of a relationship or an energetic connection that a leader brings to a process and the people involved. Regardless of which is more important to you, nurturing all seven wheels is crucial to your health, your longevity, and your ultimate success. We're gonna go through all seven. We're gonna learn the signs of wheels that are open or closed, moving too fast or too slow, and you'll get anywhere from three to six tools that you can use for each one to get yourself fully aligned and empowered. Ready to dive in? Anybody have any questions so far or need anything or have answers to those questions I asked earlier? Sarah Whitney, if anything comes in, feel free to just, to just step right in. Let me get to our next slide over here. The first wheel is the root, the foundation. The root chakra is located just above the base of the spine, right above your tailbone. Um, it's associated with the color red and it governs your sense of belonging and safety. If this wheel is stuck, you may have issues with anxiety. You may feel like the black sheep of a family or a business. A blocked root is also the place to look if you're having financial problems. Physically, issues with this wheel may manifest as arthritis, knee and foot problems, and even hemorrhoids. That's right, we're talking about hemorrhoids as a leadership issue. If you better have them, you cannot tell me that it's not a power leak. It's hard to feel like you're at the height of your power if you're having problems with your feet, your knees, or your rear end, all right? In all seriousness though, this wheel truly is the foundation of your leadership because who you are is how you lead. So who are you? We all have two primary selves, our thriving self and our surviving self. We all begin life as our thriving self. It is the very essence of who we are. You can think of it as your soul, your heart. Um, I think of it as your essence. It's your highest and best self. And as you can see on this slide, it's timeless. It's always within you. It's something that's far beyond your job title or your income or what you do. Um, something typically in our childhood happens, an event or our circumstances that teach us that life isn't always safe and we learn to build a defense system to protect ourselves. And this becomes our surviving self. Now, neither one is necessarily good or bad. It's not our job to judge the surviving self. And in fact, we can have a lot of gratitude and reverence for it. It's the instinct that keeps us from walking out into traffic or, you know, the thing that says, hey, take that populated street instead of that dark alley. As leaders, though, switch here. 
as leaders, the survival self is often ill-equipped to take us where we're capable of going. It might confuse a new business contact or an important meeting with that dark alley, and it, it'll cause us to get nervous or go into performance mode or protection mode, where we're talented but terrified, where we try way too hard to be impressive or we act like we have something to prove. Now, this is the point in the Seven Wheels presentation where I always laugh because you can probably tell I got a little extra energy anytime um, you know you do public speaking. I think it's something like 80% of people have a fear of public speaking. And I always laugh because this is the part of the presentation where my surviving self is like, are you doing okay? Is it going okay? Are we, are we gonna make it? Um, and I have to really like take a second to breathe and tap into my thriving self, the part that's vulnerable the part that's willing to explore, the part that's willing to get messy um, and to be with whatever comes up and to, to really trust myself and to trust you guys. Um, so great live in the moment example of what it looks like to check in with your surviving self versus your thriving self. Um, if you look at these lists for yourself, you probably like to think that you're a thriving leader and hopefully you are. But if we followed you around for a day, it's highly likely that we'd see maybe I don't know, some righteousness, some predictability, a little avoiding discomfort. So who is seeing themselves in these lists? And this time, I really want you to, to get over here and give us some feedback. Who will be brave enough to say which qualities from both sides of this list that they're most likely to bring on a daily basis? Like I said, I practice this every day and there are still choice points throughout each day where I'm faced with some automatic righteousness or anxiety or shame. And the work is in who you choose to be when those show up. So if you're willing to take a look and say, oh yeah, here are the places that I really struggle in my leadership and here are the things that reflect me when I'm really at my best and feeling super secure and, um, and connected with my mission and with the people around me. Any brave responders, Sarah Whitney, or are you willing to share your own? Yes. Um, so we have some tolerating, um, and we also have fear, and we have some growth and transformation, so that's exciting. And that might be all we have for right now. <laughs> okay, cool. That's great, and thank you guys for sharing. Um, it's a lot more fun over here when I can kind of interact with you guys. Um, so... What we're going to do, and I want to be I want to be mindful of the time because this is kind of the foundation and then we really get to dive into all seven. Um, I find it really helpful to take a moment to really distinguish the difference between your thriving self and your surviving self. Um, when I work with clients, I partner with them to distinguish both. Um, but for today's purposes, we'll do kind of a self evaluation version of this. So this is kind of a quick and dirty version of surviving versus thriving. What I want you to do is draw a circle in your paper and you can see the, the finished version of it here. You draw one circle and on the inside of that circle, write your fears. The ones that even if you know they are not true, they're the ones that your inner critic likes to throw at you when you, when you feel a little off your game. Um, or they're the ones that are um, maybe the ones that you've just struggled with for a long time. Um, I find some of these that I have on this chart are the ones I hear most often from some of my high performers and my most effective leaders. No matter how much they achieve, no matter how well things are going, they feel that sense of what if I'm not enough or what if I'm a fraud. Um, imposter syndrome has been a big, a big buzzword lately. So write down what your fears are, draw a circle around them. And then on the outside, we've got the ways that you compensate for or overcome these fears. So those are some of the things that I, either I or that I hear people do to try to make up for, you know, those fears when you're in your survival mechanism. So you might look for permission and approval. You might put on a show to try to like be as impressive as you can, or maybe you just worry about everybody else. And as long as you're helping everybody else and making everyone else comfortable, then everything's fine. Um, this is also a place to write down any of your avoidance habits. Um, some of us tend to, 
I'm a, I'm an emotional eater. So I'll just, I'll put my stuff out there. I tend to overeat when I'm avoiding discomfort. Um, but everybody has their own way of, of dealing with that. So write yours down and it's just nice to distinguish it and get it down on paper so that the next time you're inside of it, you can say, Oh, I'm doing my, I'm doing my survival thing. I'll give you a second to go through that. And then we're going to move on to who you are when you're your thriving self. Now, again, normally there's an exercise where I, I have you collect some feedback from friends and colleagues and um, family to get a reflection of who you are, because a lot of us are actually not present to who we are when we're thriving. We're really used to relating to ourselves as that surviving self. So it can be really illuminating to get this feedback from the people around you. But for today, since we're limited on time and I can't interact with every single person, I've got a little list of of words that you might draw from, but please feel free to create your own. And the point is to write a list of the qualities that you bring to a room when you are your highest, best self, when you're feeling safe, comfortable in your own skin, when you feel like you're truly living in a way that aligns with your purpose, whatever that means to you. So I suggest choosing at least five of these or you know, making up your own, of course, and just using them as that anchor to your thriving self. Mine are peace, beacon, joy, grace, and divinity. Anybody willing to share their five, thri five thriving self words? Sarah Whitney or anyone out there in the world? And does anyone have questions about this before we continue? I could share my own. Um, I would say warmth and family, present, um, joy, and spirit. Beautiful. Thanks and for we sharing. are good anytime. So with your thriving self in mind as the foundation and the cornerstone for everyone else, or everything else, excuse me, We'll recap the first wheel and shift here, and we'll take a look at a couple of tools to support its alignment. So when it's spinning properly, you're grounded, you're connected to your true self and to your humanity. You're connected to your worth as a person, and you're also connected to the earth. Um, you have healthy boundaries and your basic needs are met. I'm sure you can see how a healthy first wheel corresponds to how you relate to those around you. You cannot effectively lead others if you aren't willing to trust, respect, and take care of yourself. If this is too closed or slow, you might find yourself constantly shifting your personality to be what others need or want you to be. You might feel overly anxious. You might be plagued with constant financial breakdowns or a fear of scarcity around money or any other resource. You may even feel under misunderstood or rejected. With some attention to this wheel, you will be firmly rooted in your sense of self, relatedness to your family or to your tribe, your, your chosen family or your birth family, whatever. Um, and you'll be confident in your ability to meet your own needs so that you can flourish from the ground up. So what are the tools to support this? I think of these truly as the back to basics. First and foremost, your well-being, your health and well-being. It's the foundation of everything else that you do. So I suggest using there we go. A well-being checklist. Super simple. It's an actual checklist. It's a grid. Put little check marks or little gold stars or whatever makes you happy. But this is for the items that would make a difference in your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being that you historically have not been reliable to attend to regularly. The examples of this are things like exercise, drinking eight glasses of water, uh, midday meditation, I've worked with clients who needed to put flossing on there. And honestly, I worked with a client who was so busy when we first started working together that he had to put brushing his teeth on the well-being checklist. Um, that, is a, that is a drastic example. Um, but by the end of our time together, I'm pleased to say we were, we were able to take that off the checklist and we were adding in things around his diet, around bedtime, um, around sex and intimacy, and some things that were a little more exciting. Um, 
I'm going to send out a list of some free resources. And if you follow up and want that, I'll send you a list of suggested well-being places to look and items that you may overlook that would have a big impact on your effectiveness and leadership. Uh, another really easy tool for the first wheel is literally putting your feet on the floor, preferably in the grass. Leaders need time to recharge just as much as their iPhones do. Aside from good sleep hygiene, one of the best ways to recharge is to get outside. I know it's like, it sounds so simple, right? But how often do you find yourself chained to your desk and eating lunch at the desk or just working one more hour? Um, if you really actually um, are willing to take the time to get more grounded, you will find that it will completely recharge and revamp where you're coming from. So taking a minute to get grounded and I actually have earthing, feet on the floor, nature time in here, go for a hike, go for a walk. At the very least, go for a 20 minute walk in your day. Um, this is another example of one of those things that you, you kind of know, but you may not always value or be putting into practice. So keep that in mind. Another tool is to distinguish your thinking, your speaking, and your acting. This will come into play in each of the seven wheels, but since we've just discussed surviving and thriving, I'm going to use the first wheel as the reminder to choose to come from your thriving self in thought, word, and deed. If you practiced nothing else from this entire presentation, that's the core of it and that's the game changer. Um, next tool, an integrity list. Make a list of anything in your life, relationships, or business that is not aligned or does not reflect your best self. That might mean bills that are overdue, relationships that need repair or attention, projects that are behind or unfinished, well-being checklist items that are not getting checked off. Make a list of it all and commit to crossing one thing off this list each day until you are fully in integrity. You will be shocked when you make that integrity list and you start to mark things off, you'll be shocked not only in how it has you feel as far as your competence and your um, presence goes, but actually what it opens up for the people around you when you're showing up in integrity with your own commitments. Um, expect and welcome breakdowns. That's a big one in the coaching world. It means knowing that life is never all handled. You expect it, you welcome it, and you know that you can handle it. If you can handle it from your thriving self instead of going straight into survival mode, you absolutely will keep all seven wheels spinning. Um, and that's one, that's one that sometimes requires some deeper work because we all have our very automatic ways that we know to deal with breakdowns in our lives. So that might be a, a, a conversation, a longer conversation to have, but it's, it's something to keep in mind. Who do you be when things go wrong? Uh, lastly, and one of the most important for the, the root or the first wheel is financial health. Um, is there anybody on this call who does not keep track of a budget at all? Like don't have a budget spreadsheet or an app or something that you can look at on any given day and know what's coming in versus what's going out. If you don't, no shame, but that's a place to look around your integrity. Um, another resource I'll share if you want to follow up with me is actually a super simple budget spreadsheet that completely changed how I was handling my money. Uh, this is especially helpful uh, for anybody who's a freelancer. If you have fluctuating income and expenses, it is absolutely crucial that you do something that keeps you really clear. Um, if you're consistently spending beyond your means, again, I invite you to take a look at um, not only how your sense of self and security is impacting your finances, but as we move through the seven wheels, take a look at which place might help support a healthier financial life for you. Um, if you notice something for yourself, feel free to, to send a little note um, and to make a comment because what you notice really may help somebody else who's on here. So don't, don't keep that good stuff to yourself. So there's some high level stuff around who you are and then some super simple tools around um, really easy but often overlooked stuff around health, wealth, and mindfulness that will get that first wheel in order. Well, let's move on to the second wheel. The second wheel is associated with the sacral chakra, which is um, located just below your belly button. Its color is orange, and it is associated with creativity, creation of life, ideas, inspiration, and your ability to experience pleasure. 
When this is closed off, your creativity is too. And in today's world, leaders must be willing to explore creative approaches and solutions. If you struggle with a fear of looking foolish or silly, you're likely shutting off the flow of creativity and joy in your life, and your leadership is getting stale and rigid. So pay attention. Um, I find, especially with my clients who excel in analytical or systematic leadership positions, that the brain-based stuff comes so naturally that the creative or out-of-the-box stuff is a little in the blind spot as something that would make their great leadership extraordinary. I talked to a client last week, actually, who made the connection between his creative endeavors and his business. He's a healthcare executive who also happens to be an amazing photographer. He realized when he empowered his creative expression, something that he used to think of as a distraction from work or a thing to do whenever he had free time, which of course from survival mode, he never created. Um, but he found that empowering his creativity had him show up in a way with all of his excitement and his spark and his inspiration. He saw that his team was actually more productive, connected and effective during those times. More ideal partnerships seem to come out of the woodwork simply because of who he was being. So how about you guys? Do you have a regular creative expression outlet? This is a, I think we have a poll to go up to see who's actually empowering this in their lives already. Do you have creative hobbies, outlets, jobs, and passions that might stoke the fire of your leadership? Take a look at what are some of the ways that you could put them into regular practice. So we have 60% said yes and 40% said no. Okay, great. So some good stuff to work on there. Um, and this is something really to play with. And as adults, I feel like we don't really get enough intentional playtime. It's actually on the next slide where we look at what are some of the ways to get that second wheel spinning and, and moving some creative, pleasurable energy through your system. First and foremost, create daily and weekly playtime. I call it adult recess. Um, I actually make it mandatory for every single one of my clients that they create some sort of playtime every day. It doesn't matter how long it is um, and absolutely getting at least one day a week where you're just having a good time. So for those of you who don't have some sort of create creative outlet, this may be a place for you to look. Go dancing, learn to play an instrument, look ridiculous, go to a pottery class, whatever it is. Just something to get your mind off of work and allow that part of you, that sacral part to start flowing. The other practice is to get you some. Having a healthy sex life, whether it's with a partner or with yourself, is actually a component of leadership and an often overlooked one. Um, so take a look at how that's playing a role in your life and take a look at what you can do to empower it. Um, creative expression for fun, dancing. Yeah, actually like just getting into your body and having fun with it. I know a lot of people who are terrified to dance or say they're not a good dancer and that is even better. If it's something that can just feel good and not serve a purpose or not have to look good for anybody else, um, that's gonna be really great for that second wheel. So let's see, let me make sure I'm not leaving anything out. I wanna look through my notes. I'm, I'm starting to, to run pretty fast here so we get to all seven. Um, the last place to look around that that I have for you is creativity as contribution. And this may be a great place to look for those of you who don't currently have a creative outlet for yourself that you feel like you can empower. Um, how can you use creativity and joy to be a contribution to the world? So yes, it may look like creating art for others or even singing with your kids or going to a painting class, um, but it's also supporting the art that others are creating. Go to museums and concerts, donate to artistic nonprofits. The world needs your contribution to creative flow in whatever form that needs to take. So there's your second wheel. Now with all this playtime and fun, how are we supposed to get anything done? I can't tell you the amount of times people ask me that. So here's another poll for you. Are you afraid that having too much fun and creative time might negatively impact your productivity or bottom line? Anybody think, I just got to get all this stuff done and then, then it's, it's fun time. 
Let's look at the third wheel while I'm waiting for you guys to, to take a look at that. The third wheel is correlated with the solar plexus. It is a yellow ball of energy that lives in your torso, somewhere between your navel and the breastbone. It's the center of your confidence and your ability to take action. When this wheel is blocked or stuck, you may feel shameful or inadequate or hypercritical of yourself or other people. If it's overactive, you may go, go, go. You may be in a lot of action, but be detached from other people or from your purpose. Often it's, it's very empty action. You're getting a lot of things done, but you may not be getting anywhere. Um, a blockage here physically can actually cause digestive problems, ulcers, and other stress-related issues. Clearly, doing your work on the first and second wheels will support the third wheel, so keep that in mind. All of these tend to build on each other, either from the, from the ground up or from the top down. Um, when the third wheel is in balance with all of the others, we see what I call functional ambition. You're clear, you're confident, you're consistent in your action steps, and your actions and your doing are fully connected with your being. What that means as a leader is that you're walking your talk and you're inspiring other people to take impactful action. You can see, uh, yeah, you can see on this slide a good rundown of that. I'm going to shift to the tools. Um, I may have to skip over a couple of these tools just for the sake of time, and I'm going to give you kind of a quick rundown of my favorites. The frame the day and the top three is absolutely one of my favorites, and it's one that I use almost every single day in my own work. So the frame is your intention for the day. Who do you want to be in the world? What are you bringing to the party of life today? And how will your actions live inside that frame? Um, for me, for instance, today's frame is contribution and joy. As I've told you, from survival, I tend to worry about getting it right. But my frame of contribution and joy totally removes the right wrong. It's just about enjoying my work, trusting its value, and trusting people to create something from what I share. Now, inside the frame, once you've chosen that, we have the top three. This is a list of the top three things that will most impact your life and your projects today. Just three. Sometimes there are three simple to-dos or little tasks like call mom, clean the fridge, pay the electric bill. And sometimes there are bigger results that you need to generate by the end of the day. Um, finalize slides for webinar, follow up with all attendees and build relationships. Um, what else? I'm trying to think of some good examples off the top of my head. Um, the point, though, is, and the idea of having a top three is that you're done when all three are checked off. Some of us have endless to-do lists that could keep us working for days at a time, and then some of us tend to just do what we feel like and not necessarily what's most urgent or important. So framing the day and choosing a top three is a super simple structure that will streamline your day and keep you from being under or over active. The next one is the overwhelm cycle. Now, this is one of my absolute favorite tools in this work, and unfortunately, I can't distinguish everyone you know, who's here today, but um, I mention it mostly so that we can point to overwhelm as a survival mechanism. Overwhelm is just a way that we keep ourselves safely out of action, and it's just a context. It's a story that we tell ourselves when we're scared. So the next time you find yourself overwhelmed, Take on some of the practices. I especially suggest practices from wheel one and wheel seven, which we'll get to soon, and then check back in on how wheel three is doing and how that overwhelm is going. Um, if we end up doing any work together, we'll actually distinguish a cycle and you'll see exactly where in that cycle you could shift gears to completely revamp how overwhelm shows up in your life, overwhelm or burnout. Um, do it now. Yeah, this is actually a tool. The minute you think of something that needs to be handled, just take a moment to handle it before the perfectionism can swoop in and claim it. If you need to, set a timer for 10 minutes. Do whatever can be done toward the task in that time, then reset it or revisit it the next day. Uh, accountability is also a huge tool for the third wheel. Accountability structures. Like I said, many of us get so lost in the doing that we forget to check in with other people. Um, and we start to just do all the doing all by ourselves. So obviously a coach can come in handy here, but you can also create accountability buddies or a team, you know, in your office or with your friends or 
with your partner, although that can be a little tricky, you can ask my partner how it goes with holding me accountable on my diet and exercise plan. Um, but create somebody who will be supportive and who will actually hold your feet to the fire. Let's move on to the fourth wheel, which is heart. It's the heart of your leadership. It corresponds with the heart chakra, of course, which is green. And it's a green glowing light of love and connection that flows both inward and outward. Are you giving love and compassion to yourself? Are you giving it to others? Is your heart in what you're doing? Now this can go both ways, under and overactive. I recently worked with the CEO of a nonprofit whose business is so heart-based and he's so passionate about the mission and the vision, but in meetings, he doesn't give people anything to grab onto. There aren't any tangible action steps. There's no clear plan or structure for where the business is headed. So everybody who works with him ends up feeling a little helpless and ineffective. Um, if that's you, if you've got a ton of heart and maybe the third wheel is a little underactive, get clear on you know what are three action steps we can take this week to move this project or this business forward what are three results that this team can create that's in alignment with our heart and our vision on the other side if you're doing a lot but you don't feel connected to the heart get clear on what has you show up there i find this so often um, in people who are in jobs that they're not happy with you know, I say, well, what has you show up in the morning? And they say, well, because I have to pay the bills, you know, and they've gotten kind of cynical or a little resigned around it. Okay, great. So for whom do you pay those bills? Is it for your family? Is it for your kids? Is it because you love fishing and you need to fill up the boat with gas on Saturday? What is the real reason that you are showing up? Make a list of those, put something in front of you, put a picture of your family there at work every day to remind you of what has your heart be in your work and really get connected again. Um, let's see, what else do we have on our, oh, back up. There we go. Yeah, um, another great practice for this one is actually this practice of you seeing your own thriving self. Also utilize that for your coworkers or for your clients or your customers. Um, practice seeing and relating to others as their thriving selves. We, we don't always show up that way with each other, especially if we're, we're mad or scared or we're frustrated. So your job in doing this work is to actually practice radical compassion with yourself and the person in front of you and see them as their highest and best. If you want to take it a step further, acknowledge it. Actually say, you bring such joy and ease into the workplace. Thank you so much. It's very rare that we do that. We usually praise each other for accomplishments and like achievements and things we've done. We very rarely just use that heart-based vulnerable practice of acknowledging someone for who they are for us. Um, it can feel a little uncomfortable and a little bit mushy at first, but I promise you it will change the life of the person in front of you and they will show up much differently at work for you and in your leadership. Um, the fifth wheel is authentic expression. This is your speaking and your listening. It's located in your throat, of course, it's the throat chakra. It's associated with the color blue. If it's overactive, you talk too much, you lie or manipulate the truth, or you refuse to listen. If it's underactive, you don't speak your mind or you don't feel heard. The absolute best tool for this one is called a clearing exercise. I typically use it in the morning, a morning clearing. What it means is that you are just sitting down with a, a notepad and a pen and you're writing out all the thoughts in your head. Normally, it's like the white noise that goes on in the background and we just kind of operate on top of it. The problem is that a lot of the stuff that's going on in there is actually kind of disempowering or survival or past based. And it's not going to get you to the next result that you want, especially if you're trying to create something that you've never experienced before. And that could be anything from a new job to a promotion or a new relationship, whatever it might be. So take a few moments in the morning. And yes, you do actually have to physically write it down. This is not a typing exercise. Um, science has, has distinguished that there is a difference between handwriting. So handwrite all of the things that are going through your mind and get present to what is a fact about you and what is just an interpretation. Um, spoiler alert, it's mostly going to be interpretation and your job is to cross out the things that are disempowering in any way. 
And then you get to choose what you actually want to empower and live into that day, which again is another great um, a way to choose that frame for your day that we used back on wheel number three. Um, some other practices for the fifth wheel, um, again, acknowledgement, really great. Active listening, actually staying fully present in the moment, not just waiting to speak, but really receiving the input. Uh, and difficult conversations. This is a big one, and we could do an entire webinar on tough conversations, right? Um, one of the practices that I have found to be most impactful with my leaders is the willingness to clean it up. If you say something or you miss something, um, a lot of times we, we are pretty hard on ourselves about it or we tend to beat ourselves up about that thing we said. The opportunity is to actually trust your authentic expression to go back in and say, hey, we had this conversation that didn't land quite like I intended or this didn't go quite like I had hoped it would go. Can we clean this up? Can we go back in and revisit this? Now, the, the trick here is to make sure you're going in with all those other wheels fully spinning and fully empowered so that you don't just do the same thing over again. Um, that takes some practice and it takes some, some clarity. Um, another great, I don't wanna step over this one, the rewriting your materials. How many of you have your bios and your resumes and your cover letters and all that kind of stuff? And a lot of times I hear from people who say, you know, I've sent this cover letter out 40 times and I'm not getting any response. So go back and revisit it and rewrite your materials from your thriving self, from the part of you that has nothing to prove, from the part of you who knows who you are, who trusts yourself, who trusts your impact, who allows yourself to get fully connected to the person in front of you. Write a cover letter from that place and practice writing it after you've looked at your well being checklist or your integrity list or any of those other things that will really shore you up and have you feel fully confident and self assured. Um, you, will, you will absolutely see a difference if you practice that. Sixth wheel is intuition. This is your willingness to trust yourself and your inner wisdom. When this is balanced, you are open to giving and receiving. When it's blocked, you're stuck in analysis paralysis or you're daydreaming or you're really moody. Um, so what does one do to, to balance or to activate the sixth wheel? Meditation. I feel like we all hear this constantly. Um, if you're a person who empowers it, I'm sure you know what an amazing tool it can be and just how simple it is to just sit and breathe. If you're a person who is always too busy to do it or you resist or you're, you're wiggly or whatever comes up for you, know that that's okay. And it really can make a difference in um, how this wheel spins and feeds all of the rest of them. Um, the trust triangle, I'll touch on that one. Again, we're, we're starting to run out of time. I apologize. It's hard to cram all of these into, into this um, this hour, but the trust triangle is actually one of my favorites. It is the practice of trusting yourself, trusting other people, and trusting a higher, it can either be a higher spirit or a higher purpose or a higher being, whatever your version of that is, that means something different to everybody, but trusting all three of those all at the same time. Typically, we tend to trust one and then the other two are kind of eh, over there somewhere, or we trust two of them, but the third one, we're not so, we're not so sure about that one. If you can actually practice the trust triangle and empower all three corners, um, that is often a game changer. One quick note, I think I skipped over one on the fifth wheel that I really want to put in, and that was around relating from what's working. I do not want to skip over this point. There are so many of us who bond with people in the world through our complaints. You will create a world of difference for yourself and, and other people if you choose to connect from a place of what's working. Actually bring what's working in your life or ask, ask what's going well in theirs and bond and speak into that with each other. That, that's an excellent tool. Another one of those that, you know, in my opinion, if you take nothing else away, practice that one for a week and see what changes. The seventh wheel, and this is really especially, it's important for individuals and it's especially important for companies. Um, your mission and vision. What are you attuned to that is bigger than just you? Um, from the, the woo-woo side of things, this is also your connection to whatever the divine is for you or whatever a higher purpose is. Um, from a practical sense, it's just what's the impact that you want to have out in the world or what's the impact you want your leadership or your company 
to have in the world. Practices, ah, back up. Practices for this, again, back to the meditation. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not a person who practices meditation as often as I would like to say that I do, um, but I, I do know the impact of it and it doesn't have to be anything formal. It's just a moment of getting grounded and centered and being willing to pause. And you may notice that a similar concept comes up around every single one of these wheels. I think maybe a bottom line takeaway is just to slow down today. Um, let's see, another, another great tool for the seventh wheel is around identifying your highest commitments and your default commitments. What I mean by that is that we all have these really high, noble, beautiful commitments in life. You know, we want to be the provider for our family or we want to make the world a better place. We want to bring joy to everybody we meet, whatever it is. We all have some big, beautiful commitments or we just want to be love in the world, you know. Um, and then we have our default commitments, which might be things like committed to being right or committed to feeling good in the moment or um, to... You know, there are plenty of things. I could even use the example of my highest commitment to have a really healthy body and honor my body and spirit. My default commitment is to donuts. Those two do not always line up. So for yourself, make a list of your highest and your default commitments and keep them in front of you so that you can be clear on what you're choosing from. All right, we've gotten through all the seven wheels and it may seem like a lot. You know, and we did a, a pretty fast and furious version and you may be like, oh my gosh, how am I, how am I gonna actually put all this into practical practice? Um, the thing I will remind you of is that your survival mode is likely gonna have you forget some of this or it's gonna have you resist the ones that would actually make the most difference for you. So remember to have a goal that's bigger than your fear. What is it that you want so badly and that you would be so committed to that you would actually put this stuff into practice and that you would actually try some of these things that seem uncomfortable or unfamiliar to you. Um, I would love to hear from you guys if you're willing to share what some of your big goals are and what you're really here for today. Like how can this webinar actually contribute to your life in a way that's, that's worthy of you? Feel free to share. Um, lastly, I'm gonna leave you with, um, what I call the Roy G. Biv integrated check-in. Uh, I remember the seven wheels the same way I learned to remember the colors of the rainbow as a little kid. So even if you don't um, remember a tool or exercise for each one, you can really quickly mentally and energetically run through this self check-in before you walk into a room or even sitting at your desk during a meeting. In fact, we can all take a moment and do it together now. So the R. Am I rooted in my sense of self and security? Am I open to creativity and pleasure? Why is yes, yes I can. I am in action that's aligned with my being. The G for green light love. Picture an actual green light shining out of your heart like you're a lighthouse of giving and receiving. B, am I believing and speaking with truth, trust and love? I, intuition, am I trusting? What does my inner wisdom say about this? And then V, my vision. And I am, am I in alignment with my highest vision and commitments right now? Am I contributing to something bigger than myself? You've got a ton of great ideas here. You've got a ton of places to look in your own life from all sorts of different standpoints. And all of it comes back down to this one magical formula, which is insight plus action equals results. I've given you a lot of insight today. I've given you some actions to take and you get to decide what results that's going to create in your life. And again, I would love to hear from you about what that actually means. So feel free to send an email um, or visit my website. I'm going to quickly, it's 159, we're like right up to the minute here. I'm going to quickly put up some support structures for you to take on. Um, schedule a follow-up time, go to my website. I'm actually offering everybody on this webinar a complimentary, ooh, back up, there we go, a complimentary 30-minute consult or a $50 introductory power hour. Um, and the biggie is that I'm offering $2,400 off of a full coaching package. Um,
Um, and I'm happy to talk more with each of you about what that actually entails and what it means. Reach out, set up your complimentary 30, and we can talk about which one is actually the best fit for you. Um, and outside of that, create some accountability groups and talk about this work and, and choose something from each wheel that you can practice. Um, we don't have a ton of time for live questions. I'm so sorry. I really look forward to hearing from you though. And I thank you, Sarah Whitney, so much and to Vanderbilt for hosting this today. Um, and I hope to see you guys soon. If you have any questions, feel free to send them my way. Lovely. Well, we actually did have several people interested in your budget sheet, so that was exciting. Um, and we'll make sure to get those to our corresponding people. Um, and we did have one question, so I figured for those who were still on, we might as well just go ahead and address it. Um, and this question is, when I try to implement positive practices and try to be a positive leader, but I'm surrounded by negative talk and people that affect these constant practices, what advice do you have? That's such a great question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind to me is the practice we talked about around relating to other people as their thriving self. And remember that a lot of people don't know how to do that. A lot of people are, are really scared. You know, people are just walking around scared all the time. And if you can have some compassion for that negativity without getting sucked into it. It's sort of like you walk in with a Teflon suit on, all right? You've got your Teflon of, of thriving self on and all of their stuff can just slide right off of you. And you are there as an example. You're actually leading by example of what it looks like to lead with confidence and love and patience and authenticity. So it is a lot of work on your side if you're in an environment where not everybody is practicing this sort of thing. But the difference that you can make, you might actually consider if that's your situation, it's actually a really great opportunity to practice integrated leadership because the difference really is going to come from you as the source. Um, so I know, I know that's hard work and it might not be the easy answer, but, um, but it is a big opportunity as a leader if you're willing to take it on. Thank you. And then uh, two people commented that their goal is trying to find the balance and that they think that these practices will be helpful. So that's great. Good. Um, that. Yes. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. I do think that Casey did a wonderful job of going through these practices and it is a lot to cover in an hour. So make sure to reach out to her for any resources or further questions. Um, these are a lot to take in and digest anyway. So make sure to use, uh, use your time today to reflect. Um, I also want to encourage you all to check out the career resources and events we have through the Alumni Association, both electronic and in person. Um, and later this week, I will send a follow-up email with this archived link and request for feedback. Be sure to check out our next webinar with Elizabeth Sketchfield on November 4th, preparing us all for networking night, which is November 7th. All night where, I, where Vanderbilt comes together across the world to be with each other and connect. Find a city close to you on VU Connect. We are also always looking to improve upon our offerings, so make sure to be in touch and let us know how we can best support you. Thanks again for joining and have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody.